Hi, everybody. I'm Kay Helm, and this is the Your Voice podcast. Find your voice, tell your story, change the world. Each week, I interview someone about the way in which they live or tell their story. And this week, my guest is Vanessa Chase Lakshin of the Storytelling Nonprofit. She's an international nonprofit consultant, speaker, and author of the Storytelling Nonprofit, a practical guide to telling stories that raise money and awareness. Vanessa, thank you for joining us. Thanks so much for having me on the podcast, Kay. I'm really excited to be here. When I started working in the nonprofit world several years ago, I, you know, you get online and you start subscribing to all the blogs, you want to learn everything, you take all the classes. And over the years, I've rolled a lot of those just kind of I've unsubscribed or I've rolled some of those into a feed where every now and then I scan through the headlines to see if anything new or interesting has come up. But your blog, The Storytelling Nonprofit, has been one that I keep going back to on a regular basis. Oh, I'm so glad to hear that. Thank you. <laughs> so part of that is that you really, you're so focused. It's storytelling for nonprofits. You, you, know, you do some things that aid in the storytelling, but it is really about that story. It's about finding the stories. It's about you know, creating a culture of stories. There's so many things. What, what, where did you get that? Like, where is that passion for just that story and finding those stories? Where does that come from? Oh, that's such a good question. I mean, I think I have like a two part answer to that. Okay. <laughs> um, I think one is that I grew up wanting to be a writer for as long as I can remember. I, and I think like my, my personal journals date back until about age seven. <laughs> so I have like oh, cool. boxes and boxes of journals and writing and, you know, essays and all sorts of things that I was interested in exploring from like adolescence up through like my adulthood and even now. Um, so I think I have a passion for personal narrative and this idea that being able to give voice to story is a way that we can process things in our life, a way that we can heal things in our life. And there's that element that's really powerful and really interesting to me. And I think that sort of like um, intersected with my fundraising work probably about seven years ago now <laughs> when I was really interested in how to tell better stories in fundraising to connect donors to what was going on in our, our organization. And I just at the time felt like there was this real lack of resources about that. I couldn't really find any good information, but I felt like I was doing things that were working and so I wanted to share that with other people. And that was how I originally started blogging was just out of this desire to share what was going on within the organization I was working at and be a little bit more transparent and give people more tools and information that were not hidden behind like paywalls or, you know, that you had to pay to access. I wanted there to be more equity and accessibility in, in what I shared. And, and I think that still drives a lot of what I do to a large extent. Um, so I think it's a, a combination of both of those things are both like very powerful for me um, in terms of drivers of that passion and that focus that I have around storytelling. Yeah. I love the journaling at seven. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you, you talked a lot about building a culture of storytelling. What does that mean? Yeah, it's, I think this has been a very important concept for me. I've mulled this over for a long time. <laughs> and um, when I was writing my book uh, back in 2015, 2016, that was, I think, one of the first concepts that I was really interested in talking about um, and being able to explore. And I did a lot of interviewing of other organizations and trying to understand what made them successful storytellers. That was kind of a big question I was interested in at the time was what helped one organization tell great stories as opposed to another who couldn't quite get there. Mm -hmm. And so one of the things I noticed in a lot of the interviews and surveys that I did of organizations around that time was that the ones who were able to really do it well had this dedication to storytelling not being just siloed in fundraising or communications. It was something that it was pervasive throughout the organization in a good way. And that it was something that, you know, even leadership saw as a tool to connect people to the mission of the organization, to help them feel tapped into it and passionate about what they were doing and really connected to what the organization was doing in a, in a larger sense. Mm -hmm. And I think that that as like a culture building tool was really interesting to me. So I saw, I saw that and noticed that within a couple of those, these organizations. And I started talking about it as a culture of storytelling, both from the perspective of it pragmatically helps organizations tell stories, 
but also, you know, it's a really positive culture building tool within organizations that deconstruct silos, that brings people together, that allows them to collaborate. And I think just allows for that greater flow of information throughout the organization so that people who are in fundraising, communications, marketing can actually then tell those stories externally. Yeah, that's good. I think having people from every layer, um, what I found in our organization, if, if the stories don't make it to the boardroom, Mm -hmm. then the board members aren't going to go fundraising. Yeah, absolutely. I, I often say to people, I think one of the most formative experiences I've had in my raising career was serving on a nonprofit board for six years <laughs> mm. <laughs> because it really gave me the perspective of the other side of the fundraising and like governance equation that I just had not been exposed to at that point. I was a staff member and I was, you know, sometimes dealing with boards, sometimes not. And, you know, I had a lot of, I think, misconceptions and pre, like kind of judgments about what it was to be a board member and uh -huh. why they were good or maybe not good at what they were doing. And being on the other side of that conversation was so helpful for me. And I think ultimately made me a much more effective fundraiser uh, when I was working with boards. But I, I definitely noticed that too with the board I was on, which was that these board members all come to the table for a reason. They're passionate about it, mm -hmm. about the cause yeah. or the organization. And if, you know, the board chair or the executive director are not doing enough to continue to steward and cultivate that sense of passion and connection, I think it's really easy to end up with a table full of board members who are highly disengaged from what it is they're supposed to be doing. And at the staff level, it's really easy to get you know, if you're in staff operations or programs, whatever you want to call it, you get so task oriented. Yes. And so you lose those stories. And if you lose sight of the stories, then it's, you know, we noticed that in our, our organization, we were telling that more the mechanics of what we do versus this, the emotional, the stories of change that really people needed and wanted to hear. Yeah. And I, I think to me, that's part of why, you know, culture of storytelling and storytelling generally is so powerful is that it does get us to take a step back from like the mechanics and the motions of what we do on a day-to-day -day basis and asks us to remember why we do what we do and to yeah you know, kind of do our work from that place as opposed to, oh, I have this mile long to-do list that I just need to get through today. And, you know, instead it can be like, you know, I come to this organization every day because I'm so passionate about X, Y, or Z thing that we're doing. And tapping into that first can make it so much more, I think, just easier to get through some of the mm -hmm. like mechanics and the to-dos that we have to do because we feel there's purpose and passion behind those. So that why are you here is always a great question to start with. Mm -hmm. Definitely. Yeah. You talk about a, kind of the, the killer question, the, the one that you should never ask. What is that one when you're trying to get a story? Yeah, it's, it's one I think I hear a lot of people ask, and I get asked it quite often. Which me is, too. So tell me, yeah, yeah, the question that I, that I think of as like a killer question is, so tell me your story, which is probably more of a statement than a question. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but, but I think it just, it really overwhelms people <laughs> because even though we do think very narratively as humans, people feel this pressure, this like performative pressure when someone yeah. says to tell me your story. And you're like, oh, well, I haven't thought about it. Like, what's the beginning, middle and end of this thing? And like, what do I want people to know? And, you know, I think it really puts people on the spot in a very unpleasant way sometimes. And so I always tell folks that it's much better to incrementally ask questions to understand the story rather than asking this like one sweeping question <laughs> in the hopes yeah. of getting all the information you want out of that. Yeah. And it seems like such a good question. Yeah. I mean, but you think about it, like, I think we get asked the question in a lot of different forms. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I think about like networking events, for instance, like people ask like, so what do you do? <laughs> right. right. Like we get asked big questions like this all the time. And I think there's certain, like certainly people who are doing self-reflection and are thinking about these things and have like some ability to distill it into like a few sentences or some sort of like, I don't know, small story that they want to share mm -hmm. uh, when they get asked these questions. But I don't think that's always the case for everyone. Yeah, I heard somebody say once, ask, don't ask the question that they asked or don't answer the question that they asked answer the mm -hmm. question they should have asked. 
<laughs> yes. Yeah. I think people will get told that in media training quite often. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> But it's like, you know, but, but the people, and you're in a nonprofit and you're asking for stories from, say, for example, people who are benefiting from what your organization does. A lot of times there's a, a, per, a power imbalance, a mm-hmm. status imbalance, um, or even a per, you know, perceived imbalance of some sort. And yeah, how does that affect the storytelling in particular when you're in a nonprofit? Yeah. I, this is, it's interesting you asked that. I think this is actually one of the original things that got me thinking about like the ethics and kind of meta level of storytelling back in like 2011. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I was working at a social service organization that worked um, in a particularly poor neighborhood in Vancouver in the downtown east side. And they worked to support people who were homeless, um, living in poverty or struggling in addiction. So three pretty like vulnerable populations in that mm-hmm. neighborhood. And I, I really often wondered, because we told great stories, we were a highly successful fundraising organization, but I often wondered, you know, if our clients read these stories, would they be happy with the way we portrayed them? Is this yeah. how they would tell their story? And does that overlap with like what we know to be true about successful principles in fundraising storytelling? Like, are those two things at odds? And are we prioritizing the need to raise money over this need for authenticity and how we tell the story? Right. I don't know if I've ever come up with a good answer to that question. It's yeah. one I still think about because, and I think even now in like the, this kind of like political landscape we're in, like there's so many questions about oppression and how organizations and people and institutions are navigating oppression that I think to me like now is like a right right time for like really truth telling like storytelling where people Mm -hmm. are authentically sharing those stories in a way that's true for them and that maybe that's like the most powerful story to be telling rather than a story that theoretically you know would have been good maybe five years ago Mm -hmm. (laughs) so it's yeah it's, it's interesting but to circle back to your to your question i mean i think about um a rape crisis center i worked with for a number of years and telling stories of their clients, which was, I think, a very precarious task sometimes where yeah. we had to both make sure that like the, the individual who wanted to share their story was in an emotional place where they felt ready to do that. Like they mm-hmm. were, you know, far along, far enough along in their healing journey where talking about it or sharing it publicly was not going to re-traumatize them or re-trigger really big emotions. So yeah, that was something that we always thought about. Really important. Yeah. yeah. And, and I think also there's like other practical considerations where it was like, you know, if they were in the middle of, you know, um, a lawsuit or something like that, maybe they were in the middle of like suing the, their assaulter or whatever, there was a criminal case that they were involved in, you know, we had to be careful about not using their name or not sharing certain details. And mm-hmm. there were a lot of, I think, considerations around confidentiality with some of those stories. But I think that one of the principles that I learned from that organization that was very valuable for me, and I, I think I still hold on to, was that in their model of helping women heal after a sexual assault, they talked about the spectrum of going from victim to activist. And part of traveling along that spectrum and like reclaiming your power and reclaiming your story, for some women that will look like becoming an activist and getting out in public and talking about what happened to them and sharing that story. And for others, like maybe it'll stop before then and that's okay. But I think learning that there was that spectrum, that that was part of how clients in that organization sometimes wanted to heal and that was part of them like reclaiming what happened to them was actually really, I think really eye-opening for me. <laughs> like I had never really considered that storytelling for, for clients or program participants could be part of a therapeutic process in some cases where this sure. was part of their experience and part of helping them reclaim power, move to a new place in life, whatever that was. And I think that to me, I think like really resonates on a level that I think is just incredibly powerful and just kind of, I think speaks to the the breadth and depth of what storytelling can offer to people. Yeah. It can be tremendously healing. And I think that sense of control, you know, when you can take the story and give it 
voice mm -hmm. to to your this was my experience and then you it like gives you power and like I said control is a huge thing and mm -hmm. but that's the thing too with a nonprofit is a lot of times people give the story and they've given up control then of their story so mm -hmm. then it becomes right. disempowering is kind of yeah, I think it's a, it's an interesting dynamic. And I think as organizations, we ultimately have a responsibility to ethical mm -hmm. storytelling that include like that is inclusive of the people who, whose stories we're telling. And, you know, I think for me that that looks like not making unilateral decisions <laughs> without yeah. input um, and, and seeking out those who, who have generously shared their stories and asking, are you okay with this? Like, is it okay if we take this narrative and do this with it? Can we share it in this way? Uh, giving them that opportunity. And I think that all important veto vote <laughs> is, is a really, really important part of that. Yeah, that's, that's huge. And you have I know, in your book, um, the storytelling nonprofit book, you have some really good tips on how to talk to people not only to get their story and help them tell their story, but in the larger framework of kind of how your organization then handles the story, which I think is really good. Thank you. What are some of the, like the key points of that that you would tell our listeners, like the main things that they need to remember in that? Yeah, around getting, like getting the story from an individual. Yeah. I think um, to me, one of the things that I always think about is how can we hold space for that person to tell their story? So, you know, whether it was a positive experience, a negative experience, whatever happened to them, how can you hold space for whatever they say to be okay? <laughs> and that's, mm -hmm. that's always really important. Um, I think at the beginning of an interview, I always encourage people to lay some ground rules and let the interviewee know that they are the ones that are driving the vehicle and that you as the interviewer does not hold all the chips. <laughs> and so that looks like, you know, saying to them, if I ask you a question and you, you know, don't feel comfortable answering it, you can tell me, you know, I prefer not to answer that. And I'm not going to ask you another follow-up question about that. We could just skip it and that's fine. Mm -hmm. So I think being able to give them some, I, don't, I feel like permission isn't the right word, <laughs> but just, um, I think just giving them some guidelines to help them like feel empowered in that situation to say no is really valuable. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. yeah. And I think to me, when I think about interviews, the thing that always comes to mind is, I, I mean, I don't usually think about them as interviews. I think about them as like a conversation Yes. Uh, <laughs> because I think so many people have negative connotations with the concept of an interview, right? Like we think of a job interview <laughs> or mm -hmm. like other unpleasant interview situations we're in in our lives that are like stressful, that feel like maybe an interrogation or whatever. So I try to think about them more as like a conversation. And I try to show up to that situation thinking about it as a conversation where I'm there to engage with someone. I'm there to have a conversation, to be a really deep and empathetic listener, and to just be present for what's happening. I think those are, those are really important to me. Um, and sometimes that can make it difficult to take notes, which is why I'll often record mm -hmm. things on my phone or, you know, if we're having a conversation online, you know, record it through like a webinar room or something um, so that I don't have to be frantically <laughs> scribbling down amazing things that someone said, right? Yes. <laughs> and I can just listen and go back later and listen to the interview again and, and grab some of those notes and you know, pieces of information that were real gems. So I think those are, yeah, those are a couple of the, the things that I, I would think about as like guidelines for, for interviews. Tell us some of the things that you're doing um, with nonprofits now, because you've, you've been more, um, you're using a lot of the tools now that are out there that are, you know, Facebook Live, you're up, you're up there. You've got a lot of really good stuff on your Facebook and you just kind of, it, it seems you've reached out beyond the, the blogs. What's that? What's that been like for you? Well, I feel like probably much like most nonprofits, it's been a balance and a challenge. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I, go through, I think with content, I go through phases where I really enjoy being a content creator. And then I go through phases where I'm not enjoying it at all, <laughs> which <laughs> is really challenging sometimes. I think, I think for me, what I'm constantly looking to figure out is what is the best medium for both myself and the audience I reach in terms of content. Mm -hmm. And I think, you know, when I started blogging six years ago now, yeah, gosh, it's been six years. 
you know, the online content space looked so different. <laughs> like, True. No one, yeah, Facebook Live wasn't around really. Yeah. <laughs> and like, you know, I think Inst uh, Instagram may have been around at that point, but no one was really using it. And, you know, the, there was just like a very different social media and content landscape. And so for me, I think in the last year to two years, I've been thinking about what does it look like to evolve with what's going on around me and be mm -hmm. responsive to a lot of that. Um, I have found, I think that at this point, um, you know, I am, I am enjoying video content a lot more, both as a consumer and a producer of it. And I'm also just interested in having conversations with people and ways that I can facilitate conversations conversations around things I'm interested in and that they're mm -hmm. interested in, which is why I really enjoy having the Facebook community group for the storytelling nonprofit. It's really great to just have conversations and hear what people are working on and, and whatnot. And, um, you know, I think from the video perspective, um, it's been really great for me because it's both been a way for me to learn more about video editing and video as a medium for storytelling. And I, I hope that a lot of what I'm learning in my own sort of trials and errors of it are things that I can share with organizations who also may have like a very limited budget for video production, but want to dabble in that and are just not, not really sure where to get started with it. That's one of the things I've struggled with is I, I come from a, a broadcast background back mm -hmm. in the day when you had to have a $40,000 camera and a room full of equipment and, you know, you, you actually edited with tape and not on the computer. I mean, yeah. the, you know, dinosaur age, basically of video. And, you know, the idea that I can just sit down and very casually throw something up, just talking to people and that, and that it would be acceptable mm -hmm. and nobody would think, oh, well, that's not, you know, professional or whatever, you know? Yeah. And there are, is of course still a wide range of kind of quality that you get depending on how you're doing things and, you know, all the, all the technical aspects of it, but it's just so there's so much opportunity that it's almost like you have to be willing to just kind of throw yourself out there and try different things. Yes. And I think that's also where I see organizations really run into trouble because they're not able to either make a decision or <laughs> being willing to, you know, take a little bit of a perceived, you know, quote unquote, risk in trying something new. You know, I, I was working with a client on a communications plan earlier this year and one of their big concerns, and they, they weren't on any social media channels. They had a website that they had built probably 10 years ago. And so they were in a whole process mm. of doing a lot of brand updates. And, um, you know, for them, we talked about this idea of what would it look like to be, you know, more of an expert in the community on what it was they do. And um, that wasn't, you know, an impossibility for them as a goal, being more of a community thought leader. And their big concern was, you know, if we put ourselves out there, what happens if people write terrible things about us? <laughs> like, mm -hmm. what happens if someone writes an article and says that, you know, we're not actually a good organization? Or what if someone comments on a Facebook post and says something, you know, not nice about us? And I was like, yeah, well, like that's, you know, that's a valid concern because that's kind of the era we're in, right? Which is that everyone mm -hmm. is a content creator and anyone can say anything, anytime, which is both, yeah. a, I think, like a double-edged sword, right? <laughs> About yeah, being able it's good. To, yeah, yeah it's, it's good <laughs> and bad. And I think for them, one of the things that was really helpful that we spent a lot of time talking about was like, how do you respond as a company and a brand or as a nonprofit? Like, what does it look like for you to respond to things that people say? And we talked about examples of, you know, organizations that have responded well versus organizations that have not responded well oh, <laughs> to, yeah. you know, criticism. There's like lots of examples on, on both ends of that spectrum. And I think for them to just be able to see like, you know, oh, if we do take a risk and something goes wrong, there are ways for us to do like to handle that situation. And maybe yeah. we have an idea of what that will look like and, you know, how we can manage that process internally. And it doesn't have to be some sort of big crisis situation. <laughs> so. yeah, hold a press conference and have <laughs> yeah and i think it's yeah i think it's really interesting and i I've, I've thought a lot about that too just from the perspective of when i i always think of organizations born after like 2005 in the era of the internet and online fundraising versus mm -hmm. organizations that were founded much longer or like much earlier than that 
um, you know, organizations that have been primarily digital first with like an existence on the internet. Um, and I think in particular for like advocacy organizations, you know, they, they get it in a way that I think a bigger institutional organization still struggles to get <laughs> and still struggles to kind of change and shift and move about. Yeah. Well, I know with my organization, the organization that I'm with, I'm one of the co-founders and we're still very small. We've been around for 12 years now, but we're still very small. And there's no big strategy discussion over whether or not we're going to do a Facebook live. It's pull the phone out of your pocket and go live. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, <it's, laughs> hey, you can look at the person next to you and go, hey, you want to go live? Yeah, sure. <laughs> I mean, so. Yeah. Well, I think this, this is kind of the interesting thing about social media video, which is that, you know, if you think, I, and I think this is something I struggle with, which is that if you think about how you as an individual use that kind of content versus mm -hmm. you as a brand or an organization, it feels very different. And I think sometimes for a brand or an organization to figure out how they use a lot of this, it feels very contrived. And you're like, well, yeah. does the average individual who's going live on Facebook on their personal page, like have a strategy for what they're doing? <laughs> like, no, they're just going live to like share something that's happening. Yeah. Uh, and it's, I think it's hard because there, I think with individuals, there's that element of authenticity that they're able to really capture on that I think organizations are still trying to figure out how to like capture in a way that, that doesn't feel forced. Um, yeah. But I think that, that at the same time, like having a strategy definitely has a time and a place in that it hopefully will ensure that you're not spending a lot of time on things that are not supporting goals that you have. Yeah. And that's the thing too, because we do have so many channels and so many different ways to tell our stories. How do you sort through that? How do you decide which channels are going to work for you and where do I, you know, do I really need to be on, you know, Twitter and Instagram and Facebook and WeChat and Snapchat and, you know, yeah. next week chat and whatever the new thing is you know, the flavor of the month, social media, what, how do I, how do you sort through that? I mean, I always come back to data. That's always my steadfast decision maker, <laughs> which mm -hmm. is, you know, I, I, I look for, I look both at like, what is the purpose? Like we're talking about social media in this instance. So what is the purpose mm -hmm. of social media for an organization? And, you know, for everyone, it would be a little different. I can say, you know, from, for the storytelling nonprofit, like our purpose of social media is to like drive traffic to content that we create. Mm -hmm. And it's a place to build community. But I would say like driving traffic to content is probably a, more of like a priority goal than the other one. And, um, you know, thinking about that and knowing that I'm, I'm clear about those things, I, mm -hmm. you know, I want to think about where does it make sense to, to spend time building content and building out a social media strategy and it was really funny when I looked at our website analytics, like I, I look at them on a weekly basis, but I was doing more of a long-term review at the end of June for the first half of the year. And it was really surprising to me to see the percentage of traffic that we get referred from social media and from which sites specifically. And I always think about the concept of the Pareto principle, which is that 80% of what you do comes from 20% of the inputs or 80% of the results come from 20% of the inputs. Yeah. And um, that was so totally true for us with social media. And I had this moment where I'm like, I'm spending all my time trying to do all these things and it's feeling really exhausting. And I was like, what would happen if I stopped doing them? Like, is that really going to be a huge dent in this progress towards a goal that I have? Mm -hmm. And the answer was no. <laughs> and so I just kind of gave myself a permission to slip, to step back from a few of the things and to not feel like I was spreading myself too thin. And so instead I could go back and feel like I was creating content that I was really happy with and felt yeah. good about sharing with people. Um, because that was something, you know, that I, I, that was really important to me. And so I think for organizations, you know, I think being clear on what your purpose is and then looking at what is the data that supports this is really important. Mm -hmm. I think a lot of organizations get caught up in what I consider to be like the social media tidal wave, which is that we have to be everywhere all the time. And if we miss out on like one comment somewhere on a post in a month, then we've missed out on so much awareness building for our organization. 
And that's just not true. Like, I think it's important to go where your audience is and to go where you get good engagement, to go where you get good return on investment. And, you know, the more you can hone in on that and identify that, I think the more strategic you'll ultimately be in where you tell that story and what kind of results you're able to get from it. Yeah, that's that's what we're finding too. We um, we're not posting as often and we'll put the same story now as going across all the channels. Mm-hmm. Um, it may be staggered, you know, if I don't post this today, big deal, I'll post it tomorrow. <laughs> you know, it's not, yeah. it's not that strict. It's, it, there is a, a, a strategy. It's not, um, not written in stone. It's, it's fluid, but there's something there. Okay. We're going to talk about this and then we're going to talk about this and, you know, we have these things coming. So we want to build up. But the the bigger thing for us is to tell better stories. Mm-hmm. Because if you don't get the engagement, if I'm just throwing a picture up and not saying anything about it, or, you know, throwing slogans around, you know, it's just not sending, like you said, it's not sending people to your actual, the real content that you want them to engage with and getting real, what is it you want them to do? You know, I want them to learn about what our organization's doing, or I want them to make a donation, or I want them to tell a friend something, you know, there's a specific action. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it's great that you're clear on those things. It's a new thing that we're clear on it. (laughs) You know, it was one of those we did, we got caught up in the little, you know, the whirlpool of, you know, just trying to keep our head up on all these different things. You know, we're small. And so that means we need to be strategic in what we're doing. I would say, I think that's the thing I notice, um, you know, in our, in the you know, consulting I do around storytelling and also in fundraising is that there's just this kind of like consummate way in which we're always overcomplicating these things. Yeah. <laughs> and they really don't have to be as complicated as we make them out to be. And so one of my, I feel like life principles and goals this last year was to, or in this year even, is to constantly be looking at ways I can simplify, whether it's mm-hmm. things in my personal life or in my professional life or in how I do work. It's like, where can I prune back the things <laughs> that don't really make a difference so that I can focus on things that do make a difference and put more time and energy and resources into those. Yeah. We, there's one more thing with storytelling with nonprofits. We hear the phrase donor-centered communication yeah. all the time. And we touched on it a little bit when we talked about the people who benefit from the organization telling their stories and how there's sometimes conflict but what is donor-centered communication and why is that so important to a nonprofit? Yeah, so, I mean, the concept of donor-centered, I think, fundraising or communications comes from Penelope Burke, and she wrote a book called Donor-Centered Fundraising Mm -hmm. probably like 15 years ago now. (laughs) It's It's like the standard, yeah. Yeah, it's a great book, um, and there's a reason for it. And there's lots of other people who write about Mm donor-centered fundraising, like Tom Ahern. Um, the, the gist of it is though, is that it's the idea of putting donors at the center of decisions that you make and being able to provide them with really excellent service. I, I think to me, it's kind of like an equivalent of like really excellent customer experience. Um, if you think about the service you might get as a consumer, you know, at a, a restaurant or a store or hotel or anything like that, it's trying to bring more of that concept into the nonprofit world. Mm-hmm. But I think it, there's a lot of ways in which it plays out in fundraising and communications. You know, it could be something like, you know, trying to improve your uh, stewardship process where you're trying to get your donation receipt out faster and maybe make a thank you phone call to personalize it a little bit more. I think in communication zone and storytelling, it's subtle sometimes Mm -hmm. (laughs) in that it's really about including the donor in the story and being able to say, this is what you've done. This is what you've made possible. Here's how you've helped, excuse me, this organization or these people. Um, I think it's about peeling back what I think a lot of organizations do, which is be very egocentric in their communications <laughs> and not making it just about their organizations, but really making it about the community and the people who make that work possible and giving credit where credit is due and including those those perspectives and those people in the conversation. Yeah, so it's not just what, what we, the organization, did. Yes. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. I think I heard Tom Mahern once say that no one loves an egomaniac in most nonprofits or egomaniacs <laughs> when it comes to their communications. <laughs> 
Yeah. Which, is, which is true. I mean, I think about a lot of communications I've read over the years, many of which have not been great. And, and so much of it is just about like, we did this, we did that. You know, our organization is so great. Look at all the things we're doing. And I think that kind of language can be very alienating to a donor who feels like they're a part of the community and they're a part of the solution. And, mm -hmm. and so being able to, to use donor-centered principles makes space for that and makes space for the donor in that kind of narrative. Okay, so that's one. That's a principle that we talk about a lot is knowing your audience, and that's true no matter what you're doing. If you're marketing a business, if you're selling widgets, if you're selling a service, if you're running a nonprofit, you have to know your audience. But you know, we've talked about telling stories to your board members and then your staff and your con your constituents or your donors and then your people that are benefiting from the organization. You have a lot of different kinds of stories to tell and that sounds exhausting so what do you, what do you do yeah i there can be a lot of different stories to tell <laughs> and a lot of different audiences yeah. right to tell them too i think that's like the other layer of complication sometimes um you know i think for me thinking about how to prioritize what stories to tell i always come back to again like what is the big picture thing you're trying to accomplish with telling these stories mm -hmm. You know, is it some sort of brand or awareness goal? Is it some sort of marketing goal or fundraising goal? And which stories are going to help you best achieve that goal? And I think that to me, that's like a very easy decision-making framework for prioritizing that. Mm -hmm. You know, I think about like a fundraising story, you know, most likely I'm probably going to tell a program participant story or maybe an, a donor story about giving to the organization. Um, you know, if I'm thinking about telling stories to an internal stakeholder audience where I'm trying to do some sort of team building or community building, I would, you know, maybe tell a program participant story to talk about how they've been helped and how grateful they are for staff. Or maybe I would tell a volunteer story about like a great experience they've had being a part of the organization. Um, it, I think it's just a matter of, you know, understanding what your, your goal is, who the audience is and, Mm -hmm. trying to find that sweet spot of what the best story is at, the, at that time. Okay, so you've got all these different groups, all these different audiences, all these stories flying around. <laughs> Segmenting is the other thing we hear about a lot mm -hmm. when you're telling stories and, you know, you have, you've defined your audiences and we've got, I think, on some of our other marketing shows, uh, the, the marketing people that we've talked to on the podcast have talked about identifying your avatar, your person you're talking to. But when you're telling these different stories, what different things do you stress maybe to, to, to these different audiences? Oh, I think it depends on the audience and what you know about the segment. So certainly mm -hmm. that can change from organization to organization. Um, one thing I'll often say to organizations is just kind of like a a caution against over-segmentation. So I think mm. there's a point where segmenting does hit a point of diminishing returns, you know, where it just doesn't make sense. And I, I think of a, an example from someone who was in a class I taught probably four or five years ago now, uh, who told me she felt like she was getting overwhelmed at the number of segments that they had at their organization. I was like, well, how many segments do you think you have? And she was like, I'm pretty sure we have 26 segments in our donor base. I was like, really? <laughs> How many donors do you have? And it was something like, it was less than 10,000. I think it was like 8,000 donors. And I was, I, in my mind, I was like, there's no way you need 26 segments to identify and understand 8,000 donors. <laughs> like, there's no world in which that's helpful for anyone that's too many segments. And so my, I remember we had this conversation and, you know, I had said to her that, well, they, they may appear, a lot of them may appear to be different. There's probably more similarities in some of them than there are differences. And for the time being, maybe you just need to make some concessions and combine some of these segments and <laughs> try to get mm -hmm. them down to, you know, a more reasonable number. Um, so I, I feel like that's to me always like a cautionary tale of how segmentation can just become more of a make work project <laughs> in some cases. Yeah. It kind yeah. of like the social media soup, you know, is how many channels yes. do we need to be on? <laughs> yeah. It's the yeah. same thing. Really. It's a different channel that you're, mm -hmm. you're talking to. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, that's cool. Yeah. There's <laughs> so much good in your book, so much good on your blog and in this community that you're building on Facebook and um, you've got 
some courses that people can take, and especially I mean, if you're starting out in nonprofit and you want to learn how to tell stories, go to the storytelling nonprofit and Vanessa will set you up. Thank you, Kay. Yeah, we'd be happy to have listeners come over and hang out with us. Yeah, it's good. And we're building a story team. Mm -hmm. It's three of us <laughs> on, on our organization, but it's great because we've really been gifted with some excellent writers and it's just like we're trying to get on the same page. And, and so I've, you know, sent them over to your blog a couple, in, you know, for a couple of posts and read this and you'll get everything you need to know about this part. So just, again, can't recommend your site enough. It's been such a help uh, to me because I came into the nonprofit world clueless, I think as many of us do. Uh, yeah, I was <laughs> <You know>? say. <laughs> That's the majority of us. <laughs> this is where we all start. And, um, but even if you've got years of experience, it's really, um, like I said, it's a great place to keep coming back to. So really appreciate you being on the show. Thank you so much for having me. Well, folks, make sure you check out the show notes at yourvoicepodcast.com. And so every link that we've talked about, Vanessa's blog, all of that's there. Please consider leaving a review on iTunes or wherever you listen to your podcast, and that will help other people find the show. I'm Kay Helm. Until next week, this is the Your Voice Podcast. Find your voice, tell your story, change the world. Music.